Well, I'm talking this evening about uh, scopesthesia, the sense of being stared at. Um, the name scopesthesia uh, was coined only in 2005 uh, by an academic in Cambridge. Um, and I think it's a very good scientific name for this phenomenon. The Greek root scop um, is about being stared at, uh, staring or aiming. <coughs> it's not just looking, it's staring or aiming, it's sort of with an intention. And aesthesia means feeling, as in synesthesia and um, anesthesia, which means no feeling. Uh, so scopesthesia means feeling uh, the stare or aim of somebody else's intention. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is a, um, a phenomenon that's extremely well known. Uh, surveys show that about over 90% of the population, including over 90% of children, have experienced this phenomenon. Usually, both in the passive form, they've turned around to find someone staring at them, or in the active form, uh, looking at somebody else and finding them turn around. Now, I, just to make it absolutely clear, what I'm talking about now is not being interested when somebody's looking at you, when you see them looking at you, um, we're, we're all very influenced by gaze and by eye contact and so on. Um, but if you see somebody looking at you, um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to detect when somebody's looking at you uh, when you can't see them, um, typically from behind, sometimes from above, sometimes from behind a darkened window where you can't possibly see them through a one-way mirror. Um, uh, there are lots of situations where you can't see the person looking at you, and yet you can detect when they're looking. Now, this is, as I say, extremely common, very well known all over the world to adults and children. And yet, within the world of academic science, uh, there's almost complete denial of its possibility, its very possibility. Um, and it pretends that it doesn't happen, or that if it does happen, it's a superstition or an illusion, that it's only a chance and you turn around uh, millions of times, you forget all the times you're wrong, so you imagine it's scopesthesia if, if you find someone looking at you. That's one of the ways so-called skeptics have of trying to explain it away. Um, there, there are various ways in which people try to dismiss it, um, and they pretend there is no evidence, or, or some skeptics simply assert there is no evidence without having taken the trouble to look at it. Um, so there's uh, probably the biggest gulf of, of all between institutional science and this conventional um, attitude and the reality of experience, experienced by practically everybody, including scientists themselves, because scientists are mostly normal people. And they too experience this. But when, once they're at work, they have to ignore it, deny it, or pretend it doesn't really happen, or turn it into a kind of joke and try and trivialize it. Now, the reasons for this deep-seated taboo are very deep-seated in history, um, as well as in people's minds. And uh, they go back to conflicts about theories of vision, which have been going on for over 2,500 years. I'm going to come back to the theories, but I have to sketch in something of the historical background uh, to set the context for this. In ancient Greece, there were two main theories of vision. Well, there were four actually, but the two main points that were brought up were people who thought that vision depends on images coming into the eyes there's an inward flow of images, and that's called intromission, the theory of sending in of images. And the atomists, for example, the, the materialist school of philosophy in ancient Greece, thought that vision involved only the sending in of images. And of course, that's common sense. Light comes into the eyes and carries uh, what we see. The extromission theory, um, or sending out, uh, says that 
vision is an active process. We're not just passively responding to things coming into our eyes, influences coming into our eyes. Um, we're sending out the images. And so what we're looking at um, is actively constructed by our minds. It's not just a passive process. And the images we see are projected out through our eyes to the place where we're seeing them. Plato um, had a theory rather like that, but the most influential of the extramission theorists was the great geometer Euclid, third century BC. Um, and Euclid um, point, uh, said that the, what we do is project out images in what he called visual rays. And these rays move in straight lines out of the eye and uh, they project the image to where we see it. Where Euclid's theory became most interesting, really, was in his interpretation of mirrors. What Euclid argued was that when we look at something in a mirror, the light is bent by the mirror and comes into our eyes, uh, it's reflected, but the image we project out, being a visual or virtual image in our minds, um, isn't bent by the mirror, it goes straight on through the mirror. And that's why images appear behind mirrors. And uh, in his diagrams, he showed the visual rays going right through the glass of the mirror and forming this virtual image behind it. Well, we have exactly the same theory today um, in school textbooks and physics textbooks. If you look at their explanation of mirror images, um, the uh, what they do is show the reflected light, like that, and then they show the visual rays going on. When they get to the mirror, there's a series of dotted lines um, leading to the virtual image, which is behind the mirror. Um, now, that's Euclid's theory. And in the textbooks, they don't say visual rays are projected out to form the virtual image. They say that the line is produced. Um, produced um, backwards uh, to form the virtual image, but they don't discuss how it's produced or what production can possibly mean in this context. It's treated as if it's just a geometrical construction. Um, nevertheless, it only makes sense if the visual rays are actually being projected out. The mirror acts as a kind of beam splitter. Um, the, uh, what comes into the eyes uh, is the light that's been reflected, what goes out are the virtual images, and when it gets the, um, when those get to the uh, mirror, they go straight through, and whereas the um, light that's coming in is, is coming, is, is bent. So this was the debate going on in ancient Greece, and of course there were some people who said, well, why can't it be both? Um, and indeed, why not? So that's the third theory, a combination of intromission and extramission. And the fourth kind of theory uh, was really concerned more with the medium through which this was happening, what Aristotle called uh, the transparent. Um, so they were concerned with what is it that allows this process to happen both ways. Well, this debate continued through the Arab world, in the Roman Empire, through the Arab world, and in medieval Europe. And it was came to a culmination in 1604 with Johannes Kepler, um, one of the founding fathers of modern science, best known as an astronomer. Uh, but before his astronomical work um, was published, um, his first triumph, and indeed, the first triumph of modern mechanistic science, arguably, was the theory of retinal images. Kepler showed that light coming into the eyes is refracted through the lens and forms a, a small inverted image on each retina. Now, this was a tremendous triumph. Um, it solved a lot of problems that hadn't been solved before. And arguably, it's as much the culmination of pre-mechanistic science as the uh, starting point of it. Uh, Kepler was building on previous research, uh, partly on the technology of the camera obscura, 
the darkened room with the pinhole uh, through which light passes and creates an image on the back of the darkened room, an inverted image of what's outside. It's partly based on the study of lenses. Spectacle lenses were already being used in the late in the Middle Ages, and there were already people making lenses, professional lens grinders, uh, to produce spectacles. Uh, and so the principle of lenses and their ability to condense light, to focus light down into images, was already um, understood through lenses. Uh, third, there was the development in Renaissance art of perspective in painting and drawing, um, which again was based on a kind of geometric visual ray principle. And fourthly, um, there was the anatomical discovery that the lens of the eye is in fact a lens, is lens shaped rather than a spherical as people had previously assumed. So building on those, Kepler came up with this triumph of explaining retinal images. What he explained was the formation of two small inverted images on the back of the retinas. But that's not what we see when we look at the world around us. We don't see two small inverted images. We see one uh, set of images the right way up um, in full color and three dimensions rather than two dimensional images, which are on the back of the retina. Now, Kepler admitted that he couldn't explain vision itself. He thought that once these images had caused changes in the brain, then uh, it was someone else's job or once they caused the images in the retina, it was someone else's job to explain how they were transferred to the brain and how they were interpreted. And the assumption was that all this was happening inside the brain. And from then on, people announced that the intromission theory had triumphed. The extromission theory was treated as a, um, a superstition that had been defeated, rather like phlogiston in the history of chemistry. It was treated as uh, an archaic theory that had been combined to the, uh, confined to the dustbin of history. Uh, and that's how it's still presented in textbooks today. But it didn't explain vision. And there's still uh, an ongoing problem about how do we explain vision? Because having images uh, on the retina doesn't explain it. Uh, we need to explain how we actually see things in full color in 3D. And the standard materialist view is that this all happens somehow inside the brain. There are changes in the optical cortex, various nerve activities and patterns of activity in different parts of the brain. Um, and then somehow, in an unexplained way, this produces a kind of three-dimensional full color virtual reality display inside the brain. And that's what we experience uh, when we look around us we see I'm seeing pictures and books and all sorts of things in my study. Um, all those images are actually inside my brain. The, the virtual reality display theory is sounds fanciful, but this is pretty well the mainstream orthodoxy. And um, one of the uh, people who has thought this through uh, in, in, in the most uh, extreme way in the materialist camp has suggested that when we look at the sky, our skull is beyond the sky. The sky we're seeing is inside our head. It's an image uh, inside our head or a virtual reality display. And therefore it's inside our skull. So the whole of reality that we're experiencing now, everything you're seeing is supposed to be inside your head according to the official view. Now, it turns out that most people don't really believe that. They're educated to believe it. Um, they're told they should believe it um, uh, after about the age of 10. Before the age of 10, the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget found that children uh, typically think that images are projected out. They're extramission theorists. This is what comes naturally to us and is what most children believe. Um, so they think of the world they're seeing as being projected out into the world around them. That's why uh, Superman uh, is often portrayed as having rays coming from his eyes and Roald Dahl's story Matilda 
uh, with Matilda's eye beams able to affect things appeals to children. It fits with the way they see things. Of course, they know that light comes in, um, but uh, they think images are projected out. Piaget said that by the age of 10 or 11, the average European child learns the correct view that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the brain. However, in surveys carried out in Ohio by Gerald Weiner and his colleagues at the State University of Ohio, it turned out that most adults also believe in extra mission. When they showed them diagrams representing how vision works, with light coming in and images going out, the great majority of people uh, thought that vision involved both the intromission of light and the extromission of images. They were shocked to discover that the majority of psychology undergraduates at their own university believed this um, and were appalled that scientific education had failed so badly. So they put them through a re-education re course, uh, uh, telling them in no uncertain terms, the correct scientific view of how vision works. If they tested them straight after this course, they got the answers they wanted, that they, uh, most of them said vision worked only by intromission of light. However, when they retested them uh, six months later, to their disappointment uh, and dismay, they found that they'd reverted to their previous view, and the majority now once again uh, took it for granted that vision involved extra mission of images. If you talk about this subject to most normal people and tell them that um, this radical theory, that uh, it, it, the radical theory is that images are projected out into the world around them, um, instead of being all inside the head, most of them can't follow the argument. Uh, they, they just take it for granted that images are projected out. They can't see what all the fuss is about. Um, I have to go to great lengths to explain to unsophisticated audiences or non-scientific audiences um, that the intromission theory is the correct one in scientific terms from the point of view of conventional science, and that scientists really do claim to believe that all their visual experience is inside their head, including the experience of the sky. So here we have a, a remarkable situation where um, common sense, the opinion of most people, and the experience of being stared at all seem to reinforce the idea that vision involves a two-way process, the inward movement of light and the outward projection of images. And yet, within the scientific world, the so-called scientific view is that this is impossible and that the evidence can safely be ignored or denied. Funnily enough, this taboo even extended to the world of psychical research. And if you look at the psychical research literature until about 1985, there's virtually no research on this subject. The, there was plenty of research on precognitive dreams, telepathic experiences, mediumistic communications, and a number of other unexplained phenomena, but virtually nothing on this topic. Well, it turns out that there's a lot of evidence for it. So if we are now turning to the empirical evidence, does it really happen? Lots of people believe it happens, but does it really happen? Um, well, there are several lines of evidence. First, case histories. I have a collection of case histories of unexplained phenomena with over 1,300 accounts of staring at people and seeing them turn around or being stared at and turning around. Um, enormous wealth of personal experience and case histories that show this phenomenon in action in everyday circumstances. Secondly, there are the surveys that show the great majority of people have experienced this. I already mentioned uh, the surveys carried out by Weiner and his colleagues in Ohio. Uh, other people have carried them out elsewhere with similar results. Thirdly, there are studies that I've done with the help of my assistants uh, interviewing people who watch others for a living. Most of us are mere amateurs, but uh, there are some people who uh, professionals, security personnel, um, the drug squad at Heathrow, store detectives at Harrods, private detectives and non-private detectives, 
uh, there are lots of people who watch others for a living. And when we interviewed them, uh, we found that there was a general consensus, of course, this is what happens. If you're being trained to be a private detective, you're trained not to stare at the back of the people you're shadowing, um, because if you do, they'll detect your looks, turn round, and your cover's blown. You look at them as little as possible, and if you have to look at them, you look at their feet. Uh, so this is taken for granted. It's also taken for granted in the world of martial arts, where martial arts practitioners train themselves to be more sensitive to looks from behind and to know which direction that look is coming from. Um, this is some, a, a sensitivity that can actually be trained according to martial arts. Then there are experimental tests. And there have now been tens of thousands of experimental tests of the sense of being stared at. The simplest kind of test involves people in working in pairs um, the subject wears a blindfold and the starer sits behind them um, and either looks at the back of their head uh, or looks away and thinks of something else in a randomized sequence. Uh, the subject gets a signal that a trial has begun, a click or a beep, um, and within 10 seconds they have to guess if they're being looked at or not, yes or no, and they're right or wrong. And by chance, they'd be right about 50% of the time. In fact, in these experiments, uh, the average score over more than 30,000 trials is about 55%. Um, I've carried out 31 experiments of this kind with different groups of people in different countries, um, including school children, uh, college students, participants in seminars and workshops, and in conferences. Um, and in 31, uh, 30 out of 31 of these tests, the overall score was positive. Um, 27 people carried out tests, pre-registered tests at my requests in schools, colleges, and universities. Um, and 26 out of 27 gave overall positive results. Um, when you look at the overall data, many more people scored above chance than below chance, vastly significant number. And the overall significance of the results is P equals one to times 10 to the minus 20. And this is astronomically significant. Um, these, uh, even though it's a small effect, it's very repeatable and it has been repeated in many situations. Other investigators have found uh, a similar uh, results, uh, a similar pattern of results uh, to my own research. So there's now a huge body of evidence that this really happens. And this also happens in case you're wondering uh, whether it could be subtle cues like heavy breathing or smell or something like that. It also happens when people are looked at through windows or through one-way mirrors, uh, which would rule out smell and subtle cues like heavy breathing. So it's it's not just subtle cues. This experiment has also been running for over 20 years in the Amsterdam Science Museum, the NEMO Center, um, where again, 18,000 uh, pairs of people uh, took part uh, the last time I analyzed the results, and there are more since then. And again, the results were overwhelmingly significant uh, statistically. Um, so, and in the, there, the inter one of the interesting findings was the most sensitive subjects were children aged 10 and under. Uh, in my own research, too, I found that the most sensitive subjects are children. Uh, I think most of us develop, as it were, thick skins living in cities and in crowded situations where we're often looked at. Um, uh, the children are more sensitive. So there's a large body of research from these experiments, and this is summarized in a special issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies that was published in 2005, dedicated to uh, investigations of the sense of being stared at. It contains a target argument arg article summarizing the results of research up to that date by me, uh, another article on the theoretical implications, Responses by 14 scientists, including 
well-known skeptics like Susan Blackmore and Chris French, um, and then uh, a rounding up and response to these uh, comments by me at the end of the journal. Uh, this is still the most comprehensive um, publication dealing with this. Uh, there hasn't been a great deal of research since then, because although this was debated at the time and indeed controversial, um, within universities, uh, it, there's not a very strong incentive for psychologists to do this kind of research. Um, and in fact, the very publication of this um, journal issue uh, was controversial. One of the um, advisory editors, Christoph Koch, now known for his views on panpsychism, um, threatened to resign from the board of the journal if they published a special issue dealing with a subject that he dismissed as totally unscientific. He hadn't looked at the evidence because he didn't feel he needed to, because he just knew it was impossible on theoretical grounds. Well, luckily, the editor of the journal, Anthony Freeman, um, went ahead and uh, he uh, managed to mollify Koch and stop him resigning uh, by saying that he'd quote his views and discuss them. And indeed, the introductory uh, chapter by Freeman um, uh, is uh, called The Sense of Being Glared At. What is it like to be a heretic? Um, the, in fact, he changed the entire title of the issue quote, to Sheldrake and his critics, the sense of being glared at. Um, the very fact that it was discussed at all was offensive uh, to Koch and to a number of other uh, skeptics who said it, was, it, was, it would put, allow non-scientific views to be encouraged. So you see this taboo thing is not just a few people. This is, I mean, well, it is a few people because most people have no problem with it because they've experienced it, but it's a, a massive problem for committed materialists and many members of the um, orthodox scientific world. Well, it turns out that when we do research on it, um, it's rather surprisingly even works through closed circuit television. Um, I carried out a series of studies um, first of all by interview, because I believe in my own research uh, that I think in research in general, it's important to start with the natural history of a subject. And the natural history involves finding out what people have actually experienced. And we interviewed uh, security guards who do CCTV surveillance systems. Uh, we interviewed um, people in the security forces, um, people who uh, at, at Heathrow airports, in London transport, uh, in office blocks. Uh, there, are, as you know, there's CCTV all over the place nowadays. And there are people sitting in security booths with lots of screens where they can monitor what's going on. And I asked, and my assistants asked, these security personnel uh, whether they'd ever noticed that people could tell when they were being stared at by, on CCTV. Most of them said that majority of people didn't notice, but people who are security conscious, uh, particularly uh, criminals or potential terrorists, uh, became very aware of it and did detect it. Uh, for example, the store detectives, uh, detective at Harrods told me that they were once watching in the shoe department through CCTV, uh, a couple of women who came in and were shoplifting shoes. They were uh, picking up shoes and putting them in a bag, uh, shoplifting them. And he called his assistant. They were watching them closely to observe them, planning to go and arrest them. Uh, when one of the women uh, suddenly turned around and looked straight up at where the concealed uh, security camera was, um, talked to her companion, and they put the shoes back and then walked out of the shop. Uh, in America, a security guard at a hospital told me that they had an area where people were not allowed to smoke outside. Um, and he said they often saw people smoking there. And I said, well, what do you do? He said, I just stare at them hard. He said they usually glance at the camera, put out the cigarette and go away. 
um, it was easier than him actually going and telling them not to smoke there. Uh, so this kind of thing is widely known to security personnel. Um, and it's also been tested by experiment. In experiments at the Institute of Neuroetic Sciences by Marilyn Schlitz and others, and people in other universities, um, they've shown that uh, when people are looked at through CCTV in random intervals, when their skin resistance is monitored using galvanic skin response, like a lie detector, uh, there's a significant change in their emotional arousal when they're being watched by someone who they can't possibly sense by any normal means on a CCTV monitor remotely. Um, now, this has been uh, replicated too. It was challenged by skeptics, particularly by Richard Wiseman. Um, uh, Richard Wiseman did some experiments on CR, on uh, staring through CCTV. His first experiments gave positive results. He had students doing the staring. Uh, so he said they must be an artifact. He didn't believe his own results because they gave the opposite of what he expected. And then he did the experiments where he did the staring. Um, and when he was doing the staring, he got the uh, expected non-significant results. Marilyn Schlitz challenged him to do a joint experiment. Um, and uh, when they did this experiment in his lab, the first one was done in his lab. Um, she uh, had one group of subjects randomly allocated. He had another. She got a positive result. He got a non-significant result. Um, now, it's fairly easy to see how he could get a non-significant result by not wanting to, by not staring very hard. Or, and indeed, when he was interviewed afterwards by Caroline Watt, uh, he said he thought it was a waste of time. He was bored by the whole thing. And, so on. Um, whereas Marilyn really stared at people, beamed helpful thoughts towards them, made a real effort to influence them and got positive results. She could not have done that by just wanting to. She could only have done it if there's some real effect. So um, the evidence is now really strong that this happens uh, from experimental results. And um, it doesn't just happen with people. It also happens with animals. Um, I and my assistants interviewed wildlife photographers and hunters, uh, people who try and observe animals without being seen themselves. Deer stalkers, for example, do their best to stalk deer uh, in such a way that deer can't smell them or see them, because if they do, they run away. Um, and uh, quite a number have told me that if they get the deer in their telescopic rifle sights um, or just normal sights if they're fairly close um, they have to shoot quite fast because if they don't the deer feels their attention and uh, gets restless and runs away wildlife photographers who photograph birds and other animals from hides where they can't be seen they're hidden in a hide or what americans call a blind using a telephoto lens, um, find uh, that, again, they have to take the picture quickly because the animal can somehow sense that it's being looked at. Uh, we also interviewed long lens photographers, paparazzi, celebrity photographers, who photograph people from up to half a mile away. Um, and they too said that they can be concealed, uh, but when they focus on somebody through their lens, uh, that person, uh, can detect when they're being looked at. Uh, ordinary people don't, they're not very sensitive, but celebrities become very sensitive. And apparently the most sensitive of all was Princess Diana, who always said she could smell a photographer a mile off, is how she expressed it. And they said that she would, uh, she would sense them and turn and look where they were and then get out of sight. Um, so again, there's a great deal of evidence that this happens both through CCTV, also through lenses, through um, telescopic lenses and telescopic sights. Well, um, <clears throat> with animals, um, the 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 fact that animals find have this experience, have this sense, and the fact that many people have noticed it with their pets uh, suggests this is a fairly general phenomenon. A lot of 
pet owners have found that their animals can um, respond to their stare. Uh, some of them find they respond to the stare of their animals. Uh, for example, someone told me that uh, he suddenly felt restless and then saw just behind him his cat staring up at him with a sort of please feed me look uh, to which he responded and then fed the cat. So lots of people in just everyday life are experiencing this with animals. I think that this suggests the sense of being stared at has a long evolutionary history. It's not something special. It's not something that's human, particularly. Um, it's something we have because we're animals. Um, and if you think about it, there would be a strong incentive for this ability to evolve in the context of predator-prey relationships. A prey animal could tell when a hidden predator was looking at it would escape better than one that couldn't tell. So um, I think that this is a very ancient ability. Nobody's yet done experiments on whether insects can tell whether they're being looked at, although I've had quite a few reports from people who are pretty sure that cockroaches and mosquitoes and flies and other insects can tell uh, they're somehow able to evade being swatted um, in a way that goes beyond what you'd expect from just regular vision. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know, um, but it's something that could be investigated experimentally. And so could the natural history of predator-prey relationships and the role of the stare in, in uh, and, uh, how predators look at their prey. This is all still uninvestigated because of the taboo surrounding the entire subject, but I think it would open up a whole new area of natural history research. More recent research, um, um, including some I'm engaged on at the moment, um, attempts to find out more about this phenomenon uh, because if we're going to have theories to explain it we need to have some constraints on the theories and one of the first questions is is this a vector or a scalar phenomenon in other words is it directional um, like a magnetic field or is it um, scalar or quantitative but non-directional like thermometer like a, th a temperature for example is measured by a thermometer if it was a scalar phenomenon then animals or people would sense when they were being stared at with perhaps a sense of unease or danger but without knowing where the stare was coming from they just feel uneasiness that would be like a higher temperature if you like but if it's a scalar phenomenon, if it's directional, they would sense what direction it's coming from. Well, it turns out that it's a scalar phenomenon, I'm, uh, sorry, a vector phenomenon. It depends on the direction uh, from which the stare is coming in many cases. Through looking at our collection of case histories, it turns out that most of them are implicitly and many of them explicitly directional. People sense the direction of the stare. It's not just feeling uneasy and vaguely looking around to see who's looking. Um, these are very vivid, these stories. I'll give a few examples uh, because uh, case histories are the best way of feeling how the natural history works. This is from a woman uh, who made a practice of looking at people when commuting to work by bus in London. I used to be bored, so I would stare at the people in front. More times than I can mention, the objects of my staring would suddenly turn right round in their seats, as if I had spoken to them, and stare back at me with an expression of challenging inquiry. These, um, uh, here's another one from a man about an experience in a church. There was a strikingly beautiful girl with long reddish hair, two pews ahead of me and about two persons to the left. I'd never seen her before. For about 10 seconds, I'd been staring at the back of her head, admiring her beautiful hair, when she quickly whipped her head round about 150 degrees and stared straight at me, looking me in, in, looking me in the eye crossly, as though to say, stop staring at me. 
these experiences are even clearer when they're uh, from above, because people don't just turn around, they look up, which is most people don't just spend their time randomly looking up around them. Um, this is from a young man who was serving in the US Navy, who was on land looking out of a third floor window. I saw a friend walking away from the building. I decided to stare at the back of his head to see if he would notice. It took about 10 seconds and he turned around and looked straight up at me. And then I waved to him to sort of smooth over the weirdness. And then um, here's a story from a German woman in Stuttgart. Um, this is the other way around. She was the person feeling the stare. In my area, apartment blocks are five to six stories high. When I walked along the street, I usually kept my glances to the ground in order to avoid stepping into dog excrement. But sometimes I happened to look up and met the eyes of a person looking at me from one of the upper floors. This happened so often, I was surprised since this cannot be explained from seeing something in the corner of my vision. And it, I exactly met the eyes of the person right away. This happened when I was about 20 to 30 years old. Today, I am 36. This does not happen so much. Well, um, these are examples of directional scopesthesia, but you could argue these are non-random samples. Indeed, they are non-random samples. Um, and we've carried out surveys to find out how common this is. I recently did a survey through social media, through my own Facebook and Instagram pages. And um, I asked people first whether they'd experienced being stared at, about 95% of respondents had. And then I asked those who had been stared at whether they'd experienced it directionally. And over 85% of the people who'd experienced it said they'd experienced it directionally. Deepak Chopra uh, ran a similar survey, and he has far more respondents than I do, uh, with very similar results. And then I suppose, uh, I supposed anyway, that um, people might argue that people who go to my social media and Deepak Chopra's are non-random, and of course they are non-random. Um, so I thought the best way of finding out what would happen with a group of people who might be predisposed against this phenomenon uh, would be to survey a group of committed skeptics. So I asked Professor Chris French, who, as many of you will know, is a leading British skeptic. Um, he used to edit the Skeptic magazine. Uh, he's a frequent speaker in the Skeptics in the Pub program. He ran a Skeptic uh, program, Anomalous Psychology Unit at Goldsmiths College London. Uh, he's a fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Um, uh, I asked him to run a similar survey on his social media, which he did. And the results were very similar. Um, over 80% of the people said they'd experienced the sense of being stared at. Um, and of those, uh, about, no, it was about 90% said they'd experienced it. And of those, 86% said they'd experienced it directionally. So even among hardcore skeptics, uh, this experience um, happens directionally. So I think that the directional nature of scoposthesia is a very key part of understanding it. And this fits in rather well with the idea of extramission, as in Euclid's theory, that if the influences leave the eyes and travel in straight lines, you would expect it to be directional. Um, so that is an important ingredient in thinking about this. A second question that affects the way we think about things theoretically um, is the question of whether this is really to do with vision per se, with the direct looks, or whether it's to do with paying attention to somebody. And there, there's, there would be a distinction. First, if you're looking directly at somebody, uh, there might be visual rays hitting them, and they may pick up that influence. Um, but what if you look at them in a mirror? If you look at them in a mirror, uh, you're not looking at the person directly, you're seeing their virtual image behind the mirror. Does that work as well? 
Well, I don't know the answer to that. This is something we're investigating at the moment. Certainly on my database, there are relatively few cases of looking through mirrors. One of the most interesting came in recently from a woman who was an exotic dancer who danced in nightclubs and told me that she made a practice of looking at her clients through mirrors because most of them didn't notice when they were looked at through mirrors. They did if she looked at them directly. Uh, this enabled her to choose who to dance for, who'd be the most remunerative, remunerative person to dance for, for. And apparently sometimes they did look back through the mirror and then uh, she said it felt slightly sneaky looking at through the mirror. And so she had years of practice uh, and was convinced that most people couldn't tell. Some did. And the other stories I've got suggest that it's relatively rare that people pick it up through mirrors. It does happen, uh, but it's nothing like as common as through uh, direct looking. Now, another question uh, relating to attention is, well, what about if you look at somebody's photo or you look at them on video screen or look at them um, on a computer screen as in a Skype call, for example, does it work as well when you're looking at their image? I've done a long series of experiments uh, with the sense of being stared at on uh, computers where people are either looked at or not looked at by another person on their computer or through their computer. Mm. Um, and the results came out at exactly 50%. There was no detectable effect. Um, very different from direct looking experiments. So if there is an effect, uh, uh, it's a weaker effect. The CCTV experiments uh, very rarely give a positive effect if people are asked to guess, uh, to guess consciously. Uh, they work when you measure physiology, it's a much more subtle form of measuring this effect. Um, so I think it's a weaker effect, uh, that attention alone has a weaker effect than direct looking. Now, this needs further experimental research to confirm it because it's a key part of interpreting the phenomenon. Um, but the evidence so far suggests that it works best when it's directional and uh, when it involves direct looking. It doesn't work as well if it's a matter of looking at someone's photo or image or mirror image in a mirror. So um, this fits with, uh, would require theories that take seriously the directional effect of looking and the idea that something goes out of the eyes as in extra mission theories, images are projected out through the eyes as well as light coming in. Now, it so happens that the idea of the mind being extended beyond the brain is actually quite fashionable in modern uh, philosophy of mind. It's a very long standing subject, and the philosopher Plotinus in the third century AD talked about the mind being extended beyond the brain when we see things, and which is what you'd expect from an extra mission theory of vision. Um, the great philosopher Henri Bergson, who was a president of the Society for Psychical Research uh, in 1896, uh, in his book Matter and Memory, uh, said that the mind is extended when we see things, that our perceptions are not inside our brain, they're where they seem to be. And more recently, um, this debate has been taken up uh, quite widely. I revived the whole concept of the extended mind um, in 1994, in my book, Seven Experiments That Could Change the World, where I have a, it's where I first brought up the whole subject of the sense of being stared at as a way of testing for the extended mind. And I have a whole section of the book called The Extended Mind, where I discuss the sense of being stared at and phantom limbs. Um, but in 1998, uh, the philosopher Andy Clark, together with David Chalmers, uh, wrote a paper on the extended mind, um, suggesting the mind is extended beyond the brain. And this idea has been taken up by a number of other philosophers of mind and psychologists, including uh, Mark, Max Vellmans. Um, Andy Clark himself has written a book about it. Um, 
which is here, um, called Supersizing the Mind. And uh, the philosopher Alva Noe has written a book on this theme, Out of Our Heads, Why You Are Not Your Brain and Other Lessons from the Biology of Consciousness. Um, and the uh, philosopher and psychologist uh, Francisco Varela put forward an idea called the enactive mind, the idea the mind is formed as part of an interaction with the environment, it's not all inside the brain. Um, and he has a number of followers who are putting forward similar ideas. So the idea of the extended mind is no longer a controversial one, or at least it's controversial, but less so than it used to be, because there are now a lot of people arguing for this. Um, but the question is, um, do they take it very seriously? Do they think the extended mind is a kind of virtual reality display outside the head, but which does nothing? Or uh, can it do something? Is the mind really extended? Or is this just a kind of epiphenomenon that can be thought of as extended? Is it just a kind of armchair philosophy? Or is it a testable scientific theory? Materialists, of course, who think the mind's all inside the brain uh, regard the whole of this discussion as meaningless um, because for them it's impossible for the mind to extend beyond the brain. Um, uh, it's inside the head. Uh, but for the extended mind theorists, I think the challenge is, does their theory actually lead to any predictions? Now, my extended mind theory, um, which was formed uh, in connection with the sense of being stared at in the first place, um, definitely does. And I see the uh, phenomenon of scoposthesia um, as a test of the extended mind theory. Uh, the fact it's directional uh, suggests that the images are indeed projected out through the eyes. I think they're projected out through what I call morphic fields. Uh, the fields extend beyond our brains just as fields extend beyond magnets and fields, gravitational fields extend beyond the earth and fields extend um, around your mobile telephone. Um, electromagnetic fields invisibly extend beyond it. Um, I think our minds extend through fields and I think through vision they're extended towards the objects we're looking at. Somehow this extension of the mind is coupled to light. This could contain clues. Uh, it would involve, I mean, it's, this gets very radical if we think of it as being closely coupled to light because the flow is in the opposite direction to light and possibly uh, theorists like Alfred North Whitehead argue that the flow of mental causation is from the virtual future towards the past as opposed to physical causation from the past towards the future. And it could be that there's some kind of coupling of vision to light going in the opposite direction, more or less as Euclid thought. Um, but um, we'd have to interpret this in, in, in a completely new context of physics. Most physicists don't think about consciousness and certainly don't think about it as being extended in space. One of the very few exceptions is Bernard Carr, um, whose theory of consciousness um, makes use of some of those extra dimensions in M theory and superstring theory, where each uh, they have, superstring theory has 10 dimensions, M theory has 11. These are totally mainstream in physics, but most of these dimensions are chronically underemployed. Um, so Bernard is suggesting that uh, consciousness, a spatially extended consciousness, might be explained through those, um, as, if it's going to fit into physics at all, through those extended fields of superstring and M theory. Um, so I think his theory is particularly important because precisely because it deals with the fact that the mind is extended. Descartes, who created the famous Cartesian dualism in the 19th, uh, 17th century, said that the mind is not extended, matter is extended, res extensa. Uh, the mind is not extended, it's not in time and space at all. Um, and uh, that has led to tremendous confusion over the ensuing centuries. 
I think minds have to be extended. That's how we experience vision. It's how we ex even experience dreams. Our dreams are extended. There's space in our dreams. We can move around in them. Uh, we meet other people. Uh, they're not unextended outside space and time. Minds are inside space and time. And um, Bernard Carr has opened up a way of discussing this within physics. In conclusion, um, this leaves, I think, a huge amount of uh, potential research questions open. Um, there are very few people who do experimental research on the sense of being stared at. And even psychic researchers have, on the whole, ignored it uh, until very recently. Um, and I think that there are a number of questions that can be addressed quite simply. Many of these experiments could actually be done in schools. I'm currently having an app developed uh, by a professional app development company in Canada, um, which uh, works with mobile phones uh, so that people can work in pairs and the looker will be told when to look and when not to look in a random sequence on his phone or her phone. Uh, the subject will be blindfolded and they'll guess whether they're being looked at or not by saying yes or no. And their phone will detect this and record all these data on an online database. And the fact that it's on apps, uh, uh, an app on mobile phones, will enable people to do these experiments through windows at a distance. It will enable people to train themselves. I'm pretty sure that you can train yourself to get more sensitive and research would definitely be helped if there are people who can train themselves to become more sensitive in detecting stairs. Um, in martial arts programs, people already train themselves or are trained uh, to become more sensitive. Um, then there's the question of through CCTV, would it work when you have millions of people looking? It doesn't work very well with just one, but what about television when you have millions? Um, then there are questions like, would it work? How well does it work through mirrors compared with uh, direct looking? I've already got circumstantial evidence. It doesn't work as well, but there's very little quantitative data so far. So there are many open questions, including its natural history in the animal realm. Uh, which could be subjects for further research. I think it could be one of the most fruitful areas of consciousness studies, uh, bringing together um, a well-known psychical phenomenon with theory of mind and theories of vision, um, and I think could help break conventional psychology out of the narrow materialist uh, stranglehold that is within at the moment, um, opening up regular psychology, breaking down the barriers between regular psychology and psychical research, and enabling a debate about the nature of vision to go forward, having been stuck for several centuries, um, and actually arrive at some kind of resolution and deeper understanding, which would be uh, make our lives, our own experience, much more meaningful, because we'd be able to integrate it with our intellectual theories, rather than having to separate our experience from the conventional theories about the way the mind works. So there we are. Um, and I hope that some people who are listening will actually be moved to take up research on this subject. Thank you very much, Rupert, for a very, very interesting talk. Um, OK, so some uh, interesting questions coming through. Um, so one from uh, Mark Spurlock saying, um, have there been any reports Rupert, of scopesthesia being experienced by people who have visual impairments, limited eyesight, maybe even blind, where no visual triggers, um, you know, would be prompting them. I just don't know the answer to that, actually. Um, we haven't got any reports on our database from people who are blind. And um, obviously, one could do um, surveys among blind people. I mean, through blind people's organizations, um, one could actually ask um, the visually impaired and, and people who are blind uh, whether they've experienced this. Yeah, of, course, of course, they wouldn't be able to respond in the way that sighted people can do by turning around and meeting the eyes of someone and knowing they were being looked at. So they might, if they're really completely blind, they might 
they might just feel something, but they might even feel its direction, but they'd not be able to confirm it. And so they, with normal people, I think there's learning going on all the time through when you turn and you meet someone's eyes, every time that works, you, you, you f trust the feeling more. Uh, people don't think about it, but I think an implicit learning goes on, which blind people may not be able to do. I wonder whether, in fact, it might even be that blind people may be more sensitive because they've got to be very sensitive to their environment. And, and we may be able to pick that up by measuring sort of uh, physiological changes, some galvanic skin response, heart rate variability or something like that. Well, I think the um, again, the answer is to look at the natural history. And if anyone who's listening now knows anyone who's blind, then ask them. And whatever you find out, please let me know, because my assistant Pam Smart and I maintain this ever growing database. Uh, and uh, you can email me at sheldrake at sheldrake.org. So um, th th there may be people listening now who know the answer or who could find out by asking blind friends or family members. Anyway, moving on, because lots of questions here. This is a really interesting one, one that I had myself as well. Penelope McDermott, thanks Penelope. Does the effect increase, does the effect size increase, if you like, more than one person is staring at the subject so you could imagine like having one person that's staring or a group so you get a, a stronger effect with the group well it's a very good question and it's something which nobody's really done yet there have been a few preliminary tests but uh, no one systematically investigated this which is one of the reasons i think this whole field of research could have a a, a big future you know sixth form projects undergraduate projects MSC projects. Um, there are so many variables one could look at. And with the telephone app, it should be uh, easier to coordinate these experiments, right? Uh, they've all been done with pencil and paper so far. Um, and well, some have been done online. Um, but this is the kind of question that could easily be investigated experimentally, but hasn't been because so few people have yeah. done research and mostly so far they've been concerned with demonstrating that it really happens yeah. uh, rather than looking into the details that's very true that's very true and interestingly on the back of that as well extending it uh, an interesting question and point from bernard bernard carl evening bernard who mentions his hyperspatial model which uh, entails mind extending in time as well as space then suggests well perhaps it might be possible to test for a precognitive or retrocognitive scopesthesia so for example um one person could stare at somebody in a film that was recorded in the past to see if they still react um and that would be a really interesting idea i think it's a really interesting notion are you aware of anything like that that's ever been done no i don't think anything like that's been done as far as i know um, but this did come up as a possible research topic because I had a visit from some people from a well-known country's uh, Ministry of Defence um, who came and asked me whether um, with surveillance, CCTV surveillance equipment, whether terrorists would be able to train themselves to know when they were being stared at through CCTVs for surveillance systems to which I said they probably could um, and would probably be well advised to do that. Um, and then one of the people from the Ministry of Defence uh, of this unnamed country um, uh, then said, well, um, what if we introduced a time delay in the surveillance system? So you could just have a knob and turn it to five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds delay. Uh, would they still know? Uh, because if they didn't know, then uh, we could still watch them. If it was really important to see them in real time, turn it back to zero delay. Um, and I had to say, well, that's a you know, really interesting study to do. But as far as I know, no one's ever done it. Um, and as far as I know, unless it's been taken up by hush-hush research in uh, <laughs> defence circles, uh, it hasn't been done but if it has been done in defense circles it would be classified um, yeah. so uh, this uh, I, I have to say this whole area of research does um go it could easily have practical applications in surveillance and and um counter-terrorism work 
but it, it also lends itself very naturally to to testing empirically. I mean, there are an, already this evening a number of suggestions and issues have come up that you know that make, makes me think of you know well this is, it raises what I call this is an empirical question that you know we can test. It needs to be tested. So somebody out there um, or a group. Uh, you know, if we could get together uh, and, and test this, I think there's there's a lot of work that could be done. Now, Nick Morovich, um, I hope I'm getting that right, Nick, uh, says, I'm a big fan of morphic resonance and of uh, your work, Rupert. Has there been any research on whether people are sensitive on um, whether they're being listened to? And I think I remember this from uh, Ross Friday from uh, University of Greenwich, who did his PhD thesis. And he, there was an aspect of, I think he called it, Acoustothesia, something along those, my memory might be not getting that right, but. Well, I think it's a very, very good question and a very interesting one. Um, and it's one I have actually tried to investigate. Um, my first port of call was uh, interviewing spies and people who um, make software for spies and, 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 sp and spy products. Um, the, the, there was it, in Bond Street in London, there used to be a shop called the Spy Shop, which sold surveillance equipment and bugging equipment for telephones and stuff. And next door was another shop called the Anti Spy Shop. <laughs> 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 and so um, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, when I asked, I did, actually went to both these shops and asked the managers, you know. Um, do you think people can tell when their their telephones being bugged? Um, and they their answer was, and other people I've asked in the um, you know detective world um, say, well, old style bugging systems people could tell because there's sort of crackling noises and mm -hmm. clicking sounds and stuff. You know the kind of Stasi type level of phone bugging in the sort of seventies <laughs> and eighties, but um, nowadays. Um, with electronic systems where there's no crackling and you don't hear people switching it on and off or hear the person who's bugging you heavy breathing or anything. Um, most people don't seem to tell. <coughs> I also set up an automated telephone based test where we did a whole series of tests where people would sign on through their telephone worked in pairs. Uh, at, in each trial, one of the people would talk to the other for 30 seconds and in some of the trials randomized uh, they would hear music in the other trials they'd actually hear the person talking and at the end of each trial uh, the person who was doing the talking was asked were you being listened to or not the the results were pretty well at chance levels um, um so my own investigations so far have suggested that it doesn't work as well with the sense of being listened to now, it's possible that with lots of people listening, you get a different result. And I think that might be the case because I've also interviewed people who work in radio. And I've asked them, you know, when the microphone goes live and you've suddenly got a million people listening to you, does it feel different from when it's just a recording? And most of them say yes. Um, the atmosphere is electric when it goes live. But that could be, of course, because they know it's live. So the experimental test here would be to have a well-known radio personality uh, doing an experiment where some of what they're saying is live and some isn't without the red light going on in the studio that says live. Um, yeah. um, you could actually do this experiment on air uh, using real in real time with radio and see whether experienced radio people can tell. I think they might be able to. But um, I suspect it's a much weaker ability than the sense of being stared at. And it might require lots of people listening uh, for it to work. There may be some people who can train themselves to be very sensitive to being listened to or not. Um, but it, it's a different phenomenon from the sense of being stared at. It also made me think when you were talking there about that and about how when the individuals speak to each other about the relationship between the starer and the staree and whether if you like the stronger the relationship between them the stronger the effects you'd get well that again is a very important point david because in telepathy experiments of which i've done many including my telephone telepathy tests um the relationship is absolutely key 
Telepathy works best between people who are closely bonded socially and emotionally, parents and children, lovers, uh, siblings, identical twins, uh, um, therapists and clients, close friends, and so on. Um, it doesn't work very well with strangers, if at all, which is one reason why the classic J.B. Ryan uh, telepathy tests with card guessing with total strangers in parapsychology labs uh, gave, I'm surprised they gave, they did give positive yeah. results, but very small ones, and you had to have huge numbers of tests to show them. Um, uh, it's known from Gansfeld telepathy work that closely related people do better than people who aren't closely related. But the natural history of the sense of being stared at is quite different, which is why I think it's a quite distinct phenomenon from telepathy. It works with strangers. And in surveys that we've carried out, questionnaire surveys, um, when we've asked people when it's happened, it's the most common kinds of, uh, uh, of experience concern male strangers in public places where people feel a possible sense of threat, which fits with the predator prey uh, yeah. background. And yeah. you see, a predator is not related to its prey. It's usually a different species. And um, the, the, there's no bonding, a social bonding between them, um, except possible bond when the prey is being eaten. Um, but the um, it's, it's a completely different situation that sense of being stared at works with strangers um, in real life more frequently with strangers than people who are closely connected. Although if people are very close, uh, it can work better. There was a study done in Ireland by some twins, a pair of uh, identical twins who carried out a study comparing twins with others and the twins did better than other people. Um, so there are situations where if you add a kind of telepathic component to the sense of being stared at, you might get a, a, a bigger result. Um, anyway. context, I think, you know, there you, the, the issue about context is quite important. You talk about whether somebody might be in a situation that could be uh, sort of concerning. I always think of, you know, a person I don't know why the image always comes to me of somebody in a sort of in the evening or at night walking to their car in an underground car park or something like that. I mean, we had the idea a year or so ago of trying to run a scopesthesia study and using virtual reality for the stare. -y. So we put them in a, you know, in a in a sort of underground car park, but with a VR headset on. And then so they're in a sort of slightly anxiety provoking situation to see if we could find see if we could find the effect. Unfortunately, that study was scrapped, well, not scrapped, but um, put on hold because all um, um, lab research was cancelled due to COVID. So, uh, and at the moment, I don't have access to labs. Uh, and But that might be something for the future. Anyway, I need to get on with a couple of more questions. The Duncan Kaiser, the really interesting question, more general, and I just asks, uh, was there a particular personal experience or moment that put you onto your path of consciousness research? Oh, um, well, I think when I was a child, I was, I kept a lot of pets. I was very interested in animals and unexplained powers of animals. And the, the thing that first got me interested in research that goes beyond conventional science was homing pigeons. I kept homing pigeons when I was about eight or nine and new pigeon fanciers um and got very interested in the whole sport of pigeon racing and it soon became clear to me that nobody knew how they do it uh, and the the one of the experiments in my book seven experiments that could change the world is to do with homing pigeons and that was the thing that got me interested first and when i was a don at cambridge um that was the topic i took up first i did my first pigeon experiments in 1973 um, and this was before I got interested before morphic resonance um, before I got interested in morphic resonance and telepathy and things like that so uh, that was something that led me into this area but as soon as I realized there are things that science can't explain and doesn't explain and doesn't want to explain because they're taboo I then realized that there are whole areas of consciousness research, telepathy, and so on, uh, which 
are totally under-researched. And, and that's one reason I joined the SPR in, in 1982. Um, but I, in terms of the sense of being stared at, and in terms of psychic animals, which is another of my big themes of research, uh, it was mainly personal experiences, animals that picked up when people were coming home, um, animals that picked up their owner's emotions in, in my own cat, for example. Um, and then the sense of being stared at, experiences of my own when I'd be looking at people, particularly I had an experience looking out of, several experiences, looking out of upper windows down at people below. I have to admit they were usually attractive women. Um, um, that they then respond by almost immediately turning and looking up straight at me. And it was quite embarrassing when that happened. Um, and yeah. so this, uh, this, uh, this convinced me this is something quite real. It wasn't just a random searching and coincidence. Anyone who's experienced these things know they're real. And yeah. the arguments of skeptics to try and explain them away are very unconvincing, except in seminar rooms where they <laughs> sort of try and make it sound as if this is a truly scientific attitude. In fact, trying to explain away things that happen is truly unscientific. Um, so anyway, I've, I've had many and, and telepathic experiences with my own children. Those are some of the most striking I had when my uh, sons, Merlin and Cosmo, were young. I had the dramatic examples of where they'd pick up my thoughts and intentions in a way that just had to be telepathic. Wow. Okay, so Peter Mulech, Peter, thank you very much for your question. Um, asks uh, Rupert, have you uh, conducted any research on the on the feelings of the starees, but not necessarily their reactions, you know, whether they turn round or not, but uh, whether they exhibit any emotions that come up with them. For example, he says that when he was young, he did a lot of staring on people's backs when riding or whether he was out, and he often got good results. But when the people then would turn around, he often got the impression that most of them looked somehow angry. So, you know, whether it yes. made people feel in a particular way, almost as if you're infringing their privacy, I suppose. Well, exactly. And I think that the predator prey background in the animal realm is uh, one of the keys to this. You know, it's one of the ways that fights start in pubs. You know, what are you staring at me for? You know, that kind of thing. If people get aggressive um, or angry. And interestingly, if you if you look at the motives the starers have, um, they they we've done surveys on this. I'm all the, I've only talked about a fraction of this research this evening. And anyone who wants to know more can read more in my book the sense of being stared at. This is the UK edition, but actually I'd advise the US edition more because the uh, US edition is a new edition, 2013. This is fully updated edition. Uh, the UK edition is 2003. The British publishers didn't update it, but the American ones did. Um, well, um, the motives of the people who are staring um, are varied. Sometimes it's curiosity, quite often it's sexual desire, um, as the some of the stories that I told this evening about. Um, sometimes it, it, it's anger. Um, and they're usually intrusive, these, especially coming from strangers, they're intrusive emotions, they're unwanted sexual desire, unwanted anger. And of course, there's a whole folklore, which I discuss in my book, which I haven't discussed this evening, about the evil eye, the, uh, a huge body of folklore about feeling that harmful looks can harm people that, that, and are usually associated with envy, also anger. But the look of envy is considered particularly dangerous in Greece and Turkey, the Arab world, in India, in many parts of the world. Um, the uh, looks are taken seriously uh, because they're believed to have bad effects. They can also have good effects. In India, people will travel hundreds of miles to see a holy man or woman for their darshan, which literally means their look, which is believed to confer a blessing. So there's a, a great deal of um, to do with the emotions, the social dynamics, the interactions, to do with the emotions of the starer and the person stared at. Um, but it's often the case that people stared at are angry or annoyed by it because it is a kind of intrusion on their space and it's often associated with an emotion on the part of the looker that they don't particularly want it to be associated with. Uh, uh, they, they don't want 
there's so they often are angry or annoyed or like yeah. in some of the stories I read out upset. Yeah. Okay, a couple more questions and then we'll wrap up because I know it's it's approaching 9.30. So Graham Kidd, evening Graham, it's nice to hear from you, asks, um, is there any research on the types of personalities? Are some personalities better at being detected or better at staring than others? Well, again, this is one of the things that could be investigated, but I don't think has been. I mean, an obvious possibility is that people who are paranoid um, would be more sensitive than people who aren't. I mean, after all, paranoia is based on the feeling that people are looking at you all the time or thinking about you or talking about you but often looking at you and um, and are paranoid people just more sensitive than others or do they just imagine it um, now of course it'd be very hard to work with paranoid people because they'd be very suspicious of your motives for wanting to get them involved in an experiment where they watched all the time or at random intervals um, but the since over 90% of the population claim to have had these experiences, I think it's fair to assume it must cover most personality types. Yeah. Um, and um, so, again, this is a question that can be asked empirically, you know, people who experience it frequently, um, both as starers and starees, and, and uh, and some people are better at staring than others. I mean, there are some people who are much more effective. Uh, I have a friend who's a film producer, and uh, when I'm with him, it's embarrassing. You know, he says, Rupert, you're interested in the sense of being stared at. Pick someone in this restaurant. So pick someone. He stares at them, and quite quickly, they turn around looking very annoyed. And you know, <laughs> if I stare at them, nothing much happens. Um, so some people are better at that than others. Uh, but I mean, there's enough fodder in this for dozens of PhD programs. If this were not taboo within the academic world, um, yeah, there could be lots of really interesting research going on, um, lots of PhDs, and we've come up with enough material for at least a dozen PhD projects this evening. Uh, yeah. Last question then to Mara, Mara Steen, who's in, uh, good evening, Mara. It's uh, lovely to hear from you. She says, thank you very much for the talk, a really inspiring talk, Rupert, thank you. Um, but she asks a question about, in a sense, it's the opposite. Friend, is this notion of not being stared at. So sometimes she says you can deliberately avoid looking at people. And even, and even in those situations, you can sort of feel that. You feel as if you're being, or you feel as if you're somehow invisible. It's the other way around. It's like not being looked at. Have you ever looked at anything like that? I haven't, no. Um, and I don't know anyone who has. I mean, there are people who try to become invisible. You know, this is one of the things that people learn if they're, for example, spies or soldiers or guerrillas and stuff, um, or in the martial arts, you know, techniques of where you can try and sometimes they talk in terms of contracting your aura or obviously you have to stay still if you um, if if you're if it's an open country and you don't want people to notice you a basic principle of camouflage, but even if people can see you. Um, there are various techniques that are written about, I haven't tried them out myself, uh, where you can avoid people looking at you and somehow avoid attracting their gaze. Now, how effective they are, I don't know. And um, here again, taking into account the folklore, the experience of people in martial arts, you know, empirical studies, here's another PhD yeah. uh, project. Um, so, uh, you know, almost all the questions that one can ask about this could be answered empirically. Um, and they Absolutely. would shed light on the nature of our minds, the nature of our interactions. They would be of great interest to lots of people, men, women and children. I mean, lots of people would be interested in these results because it's about talking about something most people have experienced and are interested in. And yet, um, it's not done, and it's not done because of this taboo. So we just have to hope that things can move on. And 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 um, this is an area, I think it's one of the potentially most productive areas of psychic research, because it's closer to a everyday experience for the majority of people, um, and has immediate implications for the nature of the mind. And is also logistically quite easy to 
carry out. I mean, empirically, when you're looking at research, oftentimes you're looking at the logistics of how you get something done, the equipment you might need, etc. This is, you know, technically it's quite low level. You don't necessarily need much beyond two people and some pen and paper sort of thing. Well, this is, I could perhaps end with an appeal for anyone who thinks they're in a position to organize experiments of this kind, which is easiest to do if you've got a group of people, teachers in schools, uh, for example, or people who are running workshops or seminars who have a group of people who they can work with, um, um, a captive audience or who have access to volunteers. Um, if you'd like to do experiments on this, which are given a, you know, a typical test of the kind where you have 20 trials, 10 seconds each, we're talking, uh, you can do seven or eight tests in an hour. Um, if you've only got half an hour or quarter of an hour, you can do tests with people uh, that would look, give meaningful results. If anyone's interested in doing that, I have several ideas for fruitful experiments that can be done cheaply and simply and would really help to advance this field. So again, if you feel you can do that, please let me know and you can email me at sheldrake at sheldrake.org. Well, and that, that's a great note to end on this evening. 